ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow members, it's uh, a great pleasure to be able to welcome you this evening um, and uh, to introduce to you uh, the curator of Greek and Roman sculpture at the British Museum, Torsten Hopper, who is the organizer of the exhibition Nero, the man behind the myth, uh, which many of you I know have seen. And if you haven't, I think you must try and see it. It really is a splendid exhibition. Um, Thorsten is going to take us around and uh, I think explain what uh, the exhibition is trying to do with Nero, um, particularly the myth of Nero. So I, I should say also that um, the Q&A function is working and that if you have questions, um, Thorsten will be um, able to answer them after we've finished and uh, I'll uh, take you through those. But if you have any questions, please use the Q&A button and uh, put your question there. So with that, I'll hand over to Torsten. Thank you very much for, for the uh, introduction and the kind of invitation tonight. Um, the behind the scenes in, in your title, in your invitation, hints at uh, the fact that this is not going to be a talk on Nero, but rather a talk on how to put on a Nero exhibition. Um, as Tim said, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, you have another five days. Um, if you're watching this live, uh, if not, there's on YouTube a curator's introduction by, by me and my colleague Francesca Bronia, which gives you a good sense of the exhibition space and the objects in it. Um, Nero really doesn't need much of an introduction. Can't really move my presentation. Oh, here we are. Um, this is the opening exhibit in the in the exhibition. Nero uh, is famous for being infamous, and I'll, I'll just uh, repeat some of the cliches. Um, he's the matricide, the megalomaniac, uh, the uh, murderer, uh, a glutton, an arsonist, and so on. He's clearly a very popular figure in all his depravity. Um, there's been a lot of good research lately, of course, um, the, the very successful, well-attended um, Roman society seminars on Nero in, in the last year and a half are testimony to this. And there are plenty of uh, brilliant recent publications. There was therefore an opportunity for the British Museum uh, to, to develop an exhibition on the topic of Nero. We know from our own past experience and audience research that Roman history is really popular with our visitors uh, and Nero seemed an ideal candidate to, to uh, present in an exhibition. Because there's all this research, it must be said that uh, while there's a revision of the image of Nero that we have from the popular cliche that has been for a long time, very little of that has filtered through to the uh, general public. So this is something the game can do well. Um, we know from our past exhibitions on Hadrian, on Pompeii, um, that this is really uh, going into blockbuster territory. Um, our initial visit to target for this exhibition was lower, but informally was something like this. Uh, Pre-COVID, you could have expected 300 to 400,000 visitors. And that has uh, an effect on how you set up the exhibition, what sort of audience you reach, and how you try and take them through the exhibition. Now, when I began to do my research, um, I found to my surprise that there hadn't been a Nero exhibition in the UK ever. Um, there have been two more recently, one in Rome, uh, excuse the poor picture quality here, uh, in uh, 2011, one in Trier, Germany in 2016. But surprisingly, nothing in the UK. Surprisingly, because of course, here we have the Boudicca Rebellion, which features big in school curricula and so on. So, so there's a direct Nero link here. Um, just to give you some of the background and detail, uh, at the British Museum, we usually aim to have a four to five year lead time for exhibitions. And that would in, allow you to uh, get some outside research funding in to, to organize colloquia uh, and so on and turn this into a real research project. Um, that doesn't always work out. Uh, and for Nero, we had only a little over two years. The exhibition was originally scheduled to open in uh, November 2020 uh, because of COVID, we then had to delay it uh, by half a year. This 
is a short uh, illustration only of, uh, of um, uh, really the brilliant literature that is out there on Nero. At the bottom, you see the, the Cambridge and the Blackwell Companion to Nero in the Neronian Age. You see the classic uh, Griffin biography, first published in 1984, I think, um, at the Champlain's Nero uh, in the early 2000s, uh, and John Drinkwaters, which came out during the planning. And in fact, two or three relatively important mighty terms came out as we were developing the exhibition. This is just the English market, as it were. Uh, for me, I found that was, uh, was obviously a challenge. It was a lot to take in, but also a great opportunity because with that coverage and, and many of these titles are available easily, uh, we, could, we didn't need to be encyclopedic. We could uh, allow ourselves to, to set our own patterns to, to choose uh, and develop really our own narratives. This slide is a sort of retrospective rationalization of, of my thoughts when it came to putting the exhibition concept together. Um, I often get asked, um, the key thing here was really to, to uh, build on the re-evaluation of the key sources and put that out through to a general public. Um, so uh, this is not an attempt, or was not an attempt to rehabilitate Nero, but really based on this brilliant recent research, and some of it has, has older precedents, to strip out some of the obvious source bias we can identify in Tacitus and Suetonius and Cassius Pio and, and, and some of the others. And really then to see what kind of Nero we're left with, and to use this as an opportunity to look at the Neronian and more widely at the Julio-Claudian period, which is absolutely fascinating. It's a formative period of Roman history uh, and a transformative era in Roman society. I'll come back to it. Uh, Nero's legacy, of course, for a number of reasons, uh, is incredibly important and fascinating in its own right for this exhibition, because I felt we had quite a bit of task at hand, as it was. Um, I was keen to acknowledge this legacy, but then, as it were, park it and don't make it part of the main exhibition. Another consequence of this was to use only uh, as far as this was possible, first century AD objects, ideally Neronian. Um, so nothing later, and certainly not um, things like uh, 19th century woodlands or etchings of Utica. So to try and be fairly authentic and use material that was seen and produced at the time. It's also a great opportunity to, to integrate recent finds. Um, it became perhaps clear to me only in, in preparing the exhibition how many there are uh, from rescue excavations, most of them in the UK uh, and in Italy and other places as well. I decided to tell the story in a chronological way with thematic clusters, but essentially start at the beginning and go through to Nero's death. Uh, the reason for that is really again, to, to take out the element of hindsight and to make clear for the visit visitor that other outcomes would have been possible throughout. So we go through the exhibition as it were in real time. And um, the literature, obviously, the scholarly literature is, is very strong on the, the ancient literary sources. That's not something we can do uh, at great, great detail in the exhibition. But we can turn this into an opportunity. We have to tell the story through objects. Uh, and that really is, is fantastic because Many of the objects included in the exhibition, as you'll see, uh, are quite humble. They're different. They're not what's discussed uh, normally. They're graffiti uh, and so on. Uh, they complement, and sometimes they even contradict the literary sources because they were made and used by members who are not, uh, um, people who are not members of the elite. So, so they help us uh, get a, a richer picture, I think. Now, just to mention that in passing, um, I'd developed these ideas fairly early, and I felt confirmed in my approach uh, when I saw the Claudius exhibition in Rome. That was a, an exhibition held both in, in France and in Italy, uh, and followed a very different approach. And I think there will be a good opportunity here for, for people who do museum studies or, or are generally interested in how Roman history is presented to the public in comparing these. Uh, in Rome, they had many things that dealt with the legacy integrated in the main part of the exhibition, so the 19th century oil paintings and so on. They also included 
uh, lots of films, and these films were based on the literary sources. For me, uh, there was the risk that that includes, if they're not contextualized, the sort of double bias, uh, an interpretation of an interpretation. That's something I didn't want to do. Um, here to give you some of the, the parameters, um, the exhibition that we came up with uh, contains about 220 objects, um, about one third are British Museum objects, uh, two thirds are loans, the majority of them from Italy, uh, and many indeed have not seen, been uh, seen in the UK before, it's the first time they've been lent to this country. Um, 24 lenders, seven countries. Um, this uh, then leads to, in, uh, in our internal processes, you write something called a scope paper, where you set out the concepts and the aim, aims of the exhibition, which includes a fairly lofty things like a uh, what you want to develop, uh, to change visitors' perception of Nero and his reign uh, by disseminating the latest research through engaging in innovative displays, uh, things like finding no new ways and experimenting with new ways of interpreting and displaying objects something that we can use later for our permanent galleries and so on. Uh, some of these things are then, uh, that's the, the way it's done now, tested on focus groups. Um, it doesn't lead necessarily to, to major new insights, but it's a good validation of concepts and you try some objects on, on potential visitors. One thing I uh, included here on this slide is, uh, is important, and maybe particularly the, the, the academic colleagues among you, is, is the exhibition text. It's really quite limited. Um, for section panels, we have about 100 words, subsection panels, 80 words, object labels, single object labels, that is, in this case, only 60 words. Um, that really isn't much. We had to, because of COVID and social distancing and bell times and things like that, we had to cut our exhibition text halfway through by about 20%. And 60 words doesn't allow you to, to say very much. Essentially, the label becomes a driver of the main narrative. You can't say all that much about an object itself. Um, for that, we had more on, on uh, things like YouTube, uh, and uh, at least some of it, it was fewer than normal, of course. But having said that, even so, for a thousand square meter exhibition, that gives us about 15,000 words of text, and that's a lot for visitors to take in. This is uh, an early design concept. Um, at this stage, uh, in August 2019, um, Francesca joined me as project curator to take care of a lot of the practical things, especially liaising with our partner institutions in Italy uh, and an interpretation officer. A small team that worked on the text. And that's really also quite important to, to consider what visitors may know and how they're best guided through the exhibition. In a normal world, um, this is a process that comes after the main exhibition uh, book is written. In this case, we had to do it in parallel. Now, the design here is, is um, what our external partners at Drinkle Dean did. And if you've seen the exhibition, I hope you'll agree, they were very successful in breaking up this, um, this thousand square meter special exhibition gallery rectangular by box uh, and turning it into an atmospheric, beautiful space. Um, it's also the first time, and I'll, I'll come back to the reason that we've used the exhibition foyer uh, for objects. That's the prequel to the exhibition, prequel introduction, and then eight thematic sections. Austin, <clears throat> do you think I could interrupt just for one second? Um, the sound quality isn't great, and we're wondering if you were to remove your earpiece and mic, and uh, just use the computer audio, it might be better. Could we just try that? I'm sorry to have interrupted. My apologies. Um, is that better? I've taken it out now. I think it is, yes. Okay. Yes, thank you. Good, thanks, thanks for, for reminding me. Um, let me take you quickly through the section. So the prequel, as I said, the legacy is incredibly important, and I think a lot more research uh, can be done on that. Um, but it's as it, uh, based on false premises. So I, I think legacy for future research, my own included, it's interesting if you really change the angle and you, you ask why uh, senatorial elite, starting with our key uh, writers, uh, what interest they had in presenting a certain picture of Nero and then the questions and, and so on later. And that goes into the 18th century and so on. 
Um, but people all come with these expectations. I think certainly myself included, I think many of you listening, watching, um, we, we, we know Graves, I, Claudius, Claudius, God, we've read the book, uh, seen the BBC adaptation. Uh, this is our baggage, and it's, it's a great starting point too. And to acknowledge that legacy here, uh, in the back you can see, you probably recognize it, still from Kovadis 1951, but with Ustinov uh, looking really deranged and mad, just, just uh, really superbly cast as the, the, the cliche Nero here, standing on the roof of his palace, um, fiddling, i.e. playing the liar as Rome burns. Um, Torsten, I'm, so, I'm really sorry. Um, it's been suggested that if you turned your camera off there's still an echo this is the problem that we're getting and i i'm not i'm no technical expert myself so i don't really know but somebody suggested if you turned the camera off um we then wouldn't see you but um the sound quality might be better is to, could we try that it off now i'm awfully sorry about this is it better now I think so. Yes, I think so. Let's let's try that. And no, and if, if if anybody wants to make any further suggestions, please do so yeah. through the Q and A. Thank oh, you. Geez. And I'm um, so sorry. Uh, I said superbly cast. Um, he also looks like that object in front of him, and, and that is very important to me. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, us known from the Baroque period on. It's now in the Musee Capitolini in Rome. It was very famous then, it's famous now because it's, uh, it's the first image of Nero you hit when you, when you go on to Google. Uh, and as you can see on the left, um, it's basically restored. You see this honey colored section, the forehead, the eyes and so on. That's the ancient original, which in itself uh, was recalved into a portrait of the mission later. Everything else is a block restoration. It is technically superb, and it's also really well informed. It's a three-dimensional translation of the sort of distorted Nero we get from the ancient literary sources. And metaphorically, I thought this was a great object to, to start the exhibition with, as we could retrieve the, the ancient fragment, so we can try and retrieve uh, the original Nero, certainly a different Nero, if we, if we look more critically at the sources. And that really is what the exhibition is trying to do. Um, this is the introductory section, and um, again here the, the idea was to, to set the scene but also defy visitors' expectations. So in the prequel you saw the, the Nero of the popular imagination, and here's a very different Nero. This statue, uh, you may know it well, it's often illustrated, illustrated is on loan from the Louvre, originally from the Borghese collection, so probably excavated in or near Rome, and it shows Nero as a young boy. Uh, we can take this very closely to, to the period between AD 49, when his mother um, Agrippina, Agrippina married Claudius, and AD 51, when Nero took on the togo of Manhattan. So he is 12 to 13 years old, four years after this statue was carved, he would become ruler of the Roman Empire. Still aged only 16, two months shy of his 17th birthday. I think that, that already sets the scene and sets the world. Um, it was important, this is a stage photo for marketing purposes, for me also to show Nero really as a young boy. So he's displayed low here, we see him as a child. And you can just imagine uh, how uh, people projected their expectations onto him when they saw statues like these as part of family groups in public buildings. Um, or courtiers could think that this young boy might serve as a puppet to whom they could rule. But many of these ideas go, go back a long way, really. I mean, you, you, you probably all know 1994 conference volume published by Yash Elsner and Jamie Masters, um, which, which developed some of these ideas for the first time, hugely influential publication. Um, we have here, of course, the map of the Roman Empire. Um, I was very keen that we include the Parthians here, even if we're all Romanists. Um, I think that is very important for, for a general visitor in, in any sense, militarily, culturally, is Rome's equal, uh, if not superior. It's the other big global superpower. And then, of course, the relationship with the Parthians dominated Nero's entire reign. Um, so we have Parthia, the conflict over Armenia, gives us the big geopolitics of the Neronian age, 
And then at the other extreme of the empire, we have Britain, well, we'll have the Buddha Valley. And in the center, we'll have also Rome and the cities of Vesuvius. They were buried only 11 years after Nero's death, and that preserves a lot of really important evidence, some of which we, we choose to show in the exhibition as well. You see the dramatic conceit here by the designers, this huge stage curtain uh, as well. First section here, um, we meet Nero and the family of Augustus. Um, halfway through the planning, uh, we, had to, we had to change a little bit because of COVID, so we had to space out the exhibits uh, to ensure safe social distancing. Um, but, but all the key bits are here. Uh, this section is meant to, to introduce the Principate, uh, the main protagonists from Augustus to, to Nero, who will be the fifth and last emperor of the first dynasty, the Julio Cronians talk about the important role of imperial women, um, because they hold the bloodline, uh, their prominence in public life, and that's only suspected, if not real, influence behind the scenes led to a lot of resentment uh, among the senatorial uh, and equestrian elite, and that, that influences how these women are described in the literary sources uh, as, as uh, sexual transgressors, mostly, uh, and so on. It's also something about the, the inner tensions and the social dynamics uh, in Roman society. The altar on the right, a brilliant piece from the, uh, see here, detail from the Museo Nazionale Romano, um, talks about social mobility. And I, I really like that bottom relief. It's for, for two men who died earlier, were clerks or physicians. Um, but the bottom relief shows us um, the people we don't normally see and hear about. They're members of the Pets or Anna here in the short tunics, and they're really important to, to bring into the story at this point. Uh, fantastic objects here. This really needs to set the scene and, and integrate in a, in a light touch way, uh, research by people like Winterling, Alla, Kaiseris, and so on. It's, it's really getting to the bottom of, of that thing that think that uh, started by Augustus, uh, and that the problems that come with it being a, a monarchy disguised as a public, a restored republic. The next section here is working uh, titles and succession. This is about Nero taking over. An important point, let me just quickly go back. If you look at these, and the labels are very short, we had to reduce the label text uh, so to avoid cues. Uh, after two, three weeks into the exhibition. The key thing here is also that every succession was trapped. This is part of the uh, consequence of the Augustan system because it's not officially hereditary. But every succession is troubled uh, all the way before Nero, Tiberius uh, sees out his days on Capri because he's fallen out with the Senate. Uh, Caligula gets assassinated uh, three and a half years into his reign, so on and so forth. So important to make the point early on that Nero doesn't stand out in that sense at all. But here he is, finally he takes uh, over the opening object, and you'll recognize it from the exhibition poster and, and, and book cover. It's this beautiful bust of Nero from Olbia, from Sardinia. And I was quite keen to show, again, a slightly unexpected Nero. We commissioned new photographs, and I think they capture the beauty of this head, which is one of the few well-preserved Nero's that have survived from antiquity. And this is, this is the young prince. This was created in AD 54 for the accession. We put it together with descriptions by Asutonius, this soot fathers, this blonde Nero here. And he, he recalls the new Augustan age. He's, of course, Augustus' his great great grandson. Uh, there's similarities to Apollo and so on. So this is the promise of the new age. Athena remains really important for the transition. Uh, in the center, you can see this photo at least. Um, negotiations are not alone, uh, had to stop and when COVID hit all of us. Uh, this, this famous relief from other visitors in Asia Minor shows Athena crowning Nero. Important because it's part of a wider cycle that shows how the transition was very smooth. Uh, early reliefs show Agrippina with Claudius, uh, and deeds of Claudius. Uh, Nero, uh, and that's how, how it was perceived in the East, in a very positive light. Also important because it gives us a full length Nero. These are not normally preserved. And of course, he's in military body armor as commander in chief. A very important source of objects here, a uh, type of objects are, of course, the coins. And in the, in the center, you see how we displayed them. 
I hope quite successfully, not only the coins, which are difficult in showcases, um, but that we have these sort of cinematic projections uh, where you see them in great detail. And I think our visitors really appreciate this. Important objects as the, the relief of the Pretorians here on the left on loan from the Louvre really resonates uh, with British audiences. It comes, of course, from the Arch of Claudius erected in Rome to celebrate his conquest of Britain in AD 43. And Agrippina here, some of the coins and the beautiful statue that, that comes later in the exhibition. The relief again, and the one exception when I said that the objects are uh, as far as possible first century is the object here in the center, uh, ninth century manuscript codex of Seneca's apocalypsis. So this pun on, on the apocalypsis, the deification of Claudius, that's a fantastic source because it gives uh, a proper insight into the, the real opinions, the real thinking of the, the inner elite thought. I think for visitors to confront, uh, be confronted with these objects is also very important. And on the left, we had a class in the exhibition uh, of course, a portrait of Seneca, well, the only, the only portrait that has survived, uh, helpfully inscribed, um, the original is now, but then this was found in the early 19th century, just outside Rome, shocked people to an extent, because the idea we had of Seneca based on his writings was of a very different character, not this, this prosperous man who really enjoys the finest things in life here. It was Nero's tutor, very important, became one of his chief ministers. And while he became uh, a stoic saint, he was forced to commit suicide uh, in AD 65 um, during the, the Bizonian conspiracy. There was clearly an anti Senecan tradition in antiquity as well, which is important to bring out. But this is just an aside. One of the nicer design features, I think, is a shadow cast by the fretwork. Uh, and I'm just mentioning it because all the patterns you see here are drawn from objects in the exhibition. Not a nice idea. Next section, somewhat imaginative, unimaginative, but, but accurately called more and diplomacy, was really designed to show some of the challenges Nero was confronted with very early in his reign. It was from day one conflict with the Parthians about Armenia. Uh, you know the story, it's about who appoints the Armenian king, Armenia being this uh, buffer state deep in the Caucasus far away, almost impossible to control, but really important in, in, symbolically in terms of imperial prestige and contested throughout between the Romans and the Armenians. In this section, uh, uh, they also wanted to evoke some of the big monumental architecture, as you can see in the backgrounds here. The other story is, of course, Britain, uh, only recently, 11 years before Nero's accession, uh, the conquest under Claudius began, um, still very unsettled, uh, only just handed over to civilian rule, uh, a lot of fighting still going on in the tribal belt outside the province. And to capture some of this was, was important. Uh, the sort of lead object you see in the showcase there are these gang chains. Um, I was very keen that we display them dynamically and here they display it neck height. It's, a, it's for a chain gang of five. We don't know who these people were, uh, criminals, uh, maybe enslaved people about to be sold off across the channel, maybe Roman prisoners of war. Um, this is on loan from the National Museums of Wales in Cardiff, and, and I think really a very powerful object. It helps to capture um, some of the atmosphere at the time. I imagine the province swarming with tax farmers, military contractors, a lot of soldiers, really being very exploitative. Because of the fines from Britain, we get a really granular, sort of on the ground view of the reality of Roman rule and domination. That compliments what we get from, from other provinces. This was found on Anglesey, ancient Mona, center of the Druids, as a motive offering uh, in, in a lake. Other objects here, and I'll, I'll go through them very quickly. Uh, I was quite keen to have what you see in the showcase to the right, so these uh, lead picks. Uh, the spoils, uh, among the spoils of victory, according to Tacitus, um, beautifully displayed here. You don't see them often. Um, this is something about uh, ennobling unusual objects through the way you display them. Okay, important, of course, for the epigraphic uh, information they contain. That tells us a lot about uh, economic history and Roman exploitation of the province. 
the one in the back right is one of these recent finds. This was found in Wales by metal detectors only in 2019. So it was great to be able to present it here in context. It's the first time we found the name of one of the own cameras, Daniel Maximus, and uh, it's only known from the literary sources, but here it's first tested on an object. A lot of these recent finds um, are here. This is the so called Fennec treasure uh, from Colchester. That was found only in 2014 during rescue excavations in the center of Colchester. Um, clearly, highest quality jewelry is the type of thing you might find in Pompeii or Rome. It's likely imports from Italy, the silver or Roman military decorations, and we're probably uh, yeah, looking at the belongings of the veteran. Settlers couple. And the scenario must be that the, the rebels or freedom fighters, um, the, the Buddhists, the Asini and, and allied tribes enter the city and these people quickly bury their belongings and they don't live to retrieve them. Um, the human remains on the right uh, show these savage cut marks. And you see a jaw that was hacked through, a knee that was flexed and hacked through. Um, gives us a sense of some of the brutality of the fighting on both sides. Tens of thousands of Romans. Uh, hundreds of thousands possibly of Britons, the early settlements, Colchester, the capital, Camelot uh, Dunham, uh, Berlinium, St Albans, Landinium, London, Gate Porch to the ground. Completely rebuilt afterwards. Um, this important evidence to showcase on the left shows the Bloomberg tablets, less well known than the, the later uh, Vindolanda tablets, but at least as important when they constructed the new Bloomberg headquarters in the city of London, they found many more here. This was the site of Albrook, one of the lost rivers of London, uh, anaerobic conditions. These things are preserved, which is uh, one from before the Britain Rebellion to after. Uh, really important source. And they really demonstrate how important Londinium was as a commercial entrepreneur, as a supply center, and how quickly it was rebuilt after, uh, rebuilt after the good company. The case on the right is a tower from Silchester, uh, and that highlights the ongoing, really important explorations uh, and the research by the university uh, investment into inner capital. capital there. More on the section, uh, I could talk more about the context. I won't. Um, um, what, one of the key objects uh, on the right is the, the icons of the British Museum is the famous bronze head of Nero that was found in the early 1900s in the River Alde. Uh, one of the older photos here, uh, rather perhaps in this context, too dramatically lit new photograph on top, but it shows how just displaying it slightly differently uh, completely changes the appearance of the object. And that's an opportunity contextualizing an object here uh, that the, uh, the exhibition presented. So we display it here much, much higher as it would have been on the statue. The scenario, of course, is that this was yanked yeah, of the body by uh, Iceni and then taken to the river and eventually deposited there. The river mm -hmm. in a, a double boundary. It's a little statue again of Nero. Uh, I think not displayed. It's normally in, in Venice in the museum, but it shows him again as in, in body armor. As an emperor. And a lot here is about the image. We all expect Nero, based on the literary sources, as the performer, but he wasn't. He's the civic magistrate, he's, uh, he's the military commander. Other great things here uh, the Xanthan horse trappings. Many of you who, who know the museum will be familiar with these uh, from Mary 70, much better displayed here. Key objects, uh, because one of the randals is inscribed, clean your perfecto, ectum, many. Uh, commander of cavalry, prefect of cavalry, a uh, chance survival. We know that Pliny was an officer uh, in Xanten in, in Castrovetere, one of the great fortresses along the Rhine under Claudius and Nero. This may have belonged to him personally, uh, or more likely perhaps to a, a soldier serving in the unit under his command. Uh, but really a great survival, that's such a great name is attested here. But it also stands in for, for all the pressure that, that uh, was uh, on the Rhine and Danube frontiers under Claudius and Nero. Uh, most of you will know there's a tomb inscription of a governor, Plautius Elianus, uh, found at Tivoli uh, outside Rome, that talks uh, about this pressure and about his initiatives. And the literary sources are completely quiet about this. There were Neronian successes, there was a lot of Neronian activity along these fronts, but otherwise we don't hear about. Um, sorry, Torsten, again, it's, it's me interrupting. I, um, the uh, sound quality is actually deteriorating. And uh, um, one 
suggestion is if you have a headset with a microphone, that might be better than using the one on your computer. Um, uh, earlier, yeah. I tried the opposite, so I don't know what to do. I don't know if it's to do with the the quality of the internet here in the museum. I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, yeah. you sounded very clear to me just then speaking, so... Um, so I continue. I'll speak more slowly. Maybe that makes it a little easier. Yes, let's let's try that. I really don't know what else to suggest. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, dialing in by telephone, I'm told, is a good alternative option, whatever that means. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I'm so hopeless at all this, but that is a suggestion that's been made by somebody who clearly understands these things better than I do. Dialing in by phone, if that makes sense. We just but, see if I continue for a little, if it improves. Yes, do, Torsten, and I oh, think... I'm, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, that's that's um, okay, so am I. This, um, this is the next section, which was really... Um, was, uh, with the expectations uh, people had of the emperor. Um, uh, not in the picture on the left, you would see... Uh, he has this coinage that talks about his investments in infrastructure and architecture, his tax and currency reforms. He does everything um, people want of the emperor, particularly members of the Pepe Urbana. He looks after the grain supply. Um, he puts up a new market building, famous new baths, of course, that are talked about by Marshall, a new amphitheater that later crashes in the fire. For me, uh, one of the, and you see gladiator, I may have his own troop of gladiators in the center. For me, one of the key objects, and we had an interesting discussion uh, the other week when academic colleagues came in, is what you see here on the right in the foreground. It's an antenarius, an enslaved boy that, uh, that uh, clearly waits for his master, he's fallen asleep, light him the way home. In, in all honesty, I find the object itself aesthetically challenging. But it's very important to me. It's a, it is a prop, admittedly. It stands on in for an important event that happened in the middle of Nero's reign. It was the murder of the governor of Rome, uh, Annius Secundus, by one of his slaves. An ancient law meant that, in that case, all the slaves in the household had to be executed. This was a very rich man, so he had 400 slaves, um, 399 of them potentially innocent. Tacitus tells us a lot. He says that the debates in the Senate, that younger senators didn't want to enforce the law, that the plebs rose in solidarity with the slaves, besieged the Senate House. Eventually, Nero had to, to follow the, the leading senators, uh, and this was enforced. But there were big protests. And I think this is really the most interesting period of Nero's reign, because before uh, we know from Tacitus there were riots in Puteri, the big commercial port down south that had to be put down by the military. Uh, there were the, the famous riots in the amphitheater in Pompeii that may have to do with conflict between the locals and recently settled army veterans from the regions in the east. So there's a lot going on in society and the sources, and, and I find also the secondary literature, don't tell us much about this. But clearly, this must form much of the background. Nero's reign. His hands were probably padded also because the, the leading protagonists uh, were members of a particular clan that is later linked to the conspiracy. And Corbulo, the big commander in the East with all the legions behind him, was part of that, that family group. This section here talks about the role of women. There's this fantastic statue uh, from, from Rome, from the Musei Capitolini of Agrippina, it really shows us. Uh, the quality of Roman art at this elite level. It's a small statue here of what I've gently suggested, maybe an imaginary portrait, perhaps, of Nero's daughter. Uh, lumping the women together is, is, is not a useful category. We've done it very much for practical reasons. Um, because they get such a bad rapport in the, in the literature, uh, they, may, most of them suffer damnatio memoriae. The objects work better as a group. Other than Agrippina, many of the identifications are not certain at all. This is how we tried, in one example at least, to deal a little bit with the source dynamic. At the bottom, we have a quote from Seneca's Oedipus, um, where certain ideas first introduced, and it's, it's purely fictional, they are mythological practice. And we have the Oedipus play, uh, formed probably 
published immediately after Nero's death, and suddenly the same thought, the same words almost are put into Agrippina's mouth. And then again later, Cassius Dino on top, it's Agrippina talking about Nero. That's a small example, but it shows perhaps how from fiction uh, this almost becomes history in the late writings. And, and it's therefore very important to be critical. And this was one way of, of alerting visitors to it. Another thing here, um, uh, I'll be quick. One of my favorite objects is this thing in the center. Someone's kitchen wall from Pompeii has these incised graffiti. And among them is a beautiful poem that commemorates Nero's visit to the city, otherwise uh, unattested, and the fact that he and uh, sent gifts to the local temple of Venus. Fantastic to have this, as I said, not in the literary sources. And looking back, I'm interested here in the, what you see on the back wall. Um, there as graphic reproductions, uh, some of the graffiti or the rather deep painting you find on the outside of Pompeian houses, and they talk about the, the, the Nero Popeyenses, the, the fans, the supporters, uh, organized supporters of Nero and Popeya. And they again speak to some sort of street level uh, popularity. You didn't have to join these, it's probably advantageous, but you certainly didn't have to. What's also important is that these things were still found on the walls of these houses 11 years after Nero's death. So they hadn't been excised, they hadn't been whitewashed, and that probably tells us something as well. It's more here on Nero as the performer, a little display that shows him uh, on stage, as it were, as the first emperor to appear on stage. That all needs to be contextualized. We've tried to do it uh, briefly in the exhibition text. There's more, more on it in the catalogs, uh, in the catalog. Uh, there's, a, there's a big cultural and political context you have to keep in mind. Uh, I won't go into that now, but uh, uh, I want to point out these two objects in the showcases further back. Uh, beautiful ivory uh, of a tragic actor in all its fabulous detail on loan from the Petit Palais in Paris. We're very fortunate to get it. It's very fragile. Um, very grateful to the colleagues. And then things that, that are actually really important, like the coin that you, you may have seen illustrated many a time, but here it's in magnification. This is important because Suetonius, uh, in writing his Nero biography, must have held just the coin like this in his hands. And he says, Nero, this depraved character, even put himself in the lie on his coin. So you can, you can even see already on this photo here, if you go at this with magnification, there are no portrait features of Nero. This is Suetonius so sees what he wants to see. More than because culturally, politically, the world of the theater of the stage is so important. Uh, all the middle class houses in Pompeii have these things as a fresco here, beautiful objects. Um, next section here is about the seminal event of Nero's reign, certainly uh, in retrospect, that's the great fire of Rome in AD 64, in summer of AD 64. This was in the exhibition, slightly more immersive. We had the projections. It's a lot in the literary sources, of course, on Tacitus's description of the fire as a classic of disaster literature. It's very hard to do this in an exhibition. I think we found a good compromise, and thankfully, there was this object. Uh, you see it in situ on the right and then in the showcase. Um, it was in the tree exhibition before, but it's a recent find, a relatively recent find in, in about 2000 between the Palatine and what is now the Colosseum. It's an iron window grating, and if you look at it, you can see how it's warped. And you can really read from this object the force of the fire, the intense heat, and so on. Uh, projection that's a close display. Yeah, it was, of course, universally blamed. Uh, I'm, I'm fairly certain it was innocent. There's, there's a lot in recent literature and, and uh, Barrett's book has just come out. Um, the, the, the great references. Um, the, the reason surely must be that he, he blamed uh, the Jew, a Jewish sect, people we now know as Christians. And that leads to a, a, a strong anti neronian Judeo Christian tradition from late antiquity through the medieval period into the present. That's why Nero stands out over people like Caligula and the mission of the evil emperors. So this is an opportunity to one object to, to, to really uh, create an emotional bond as well in visitors and, and bring this to life. The next section we've entitled The New Apollo and, and you'll recognize an allusion to the Domus Area, the Golden House here in this section. This is, this is based on, on the, the panel room in the center of the Escalin wing. Um, there's much to be said, a lot of great new research both on the on the architecture of the building, the function, the construction history, 
I mean, they've even found just, just before the exhibition started a new underground chamber there. Uh, and it really is about uh, the uses. Much of this wasn't finished at the uh, time of Nero's death, uh, and certainly it was reinterpreted. But also important to remember that Nero's immediate successors, far from condemning his activities, uh, continued construction on his life. We're fortunate to have in the British Museum the only loose fragments to see in the center, uh, and again, the beautiful loans and a lot of research has been done on them. Other showcases here on the right, you see the uh, silver treasure found only in about 2000, just outside Pompeii. It speaks to the age of luxury. We know from the context that this silver treasure, splendid as it looks, was probably owned by some freedmen. Uh, and that recalls, uh, of course, figures like Petronius and the Satyricon, the, the fictional actor of Trimalchio, who's this rich upstart, badly uneducated freedman. And you can read the text as something that's very funny. Um, but it also speaks to elite anxiety. I think if, if money is the measure of all things, then, then everyone can compete at that level. And it's, it's really other things like education, where, where you can show your status as a member of the traditional elite against these newcomers and upstarts. Going out, um, this was what we call the golden day. Uh, and it really is about the moment in AD 66 when the Parthian candidate for the Armenian throne, that was the diplomatic solution they arrived at, um, comes to Rome to be crowned by Nero. That was, that was the stipulation, to be crowned by Nero officially on the forum. For good measure, that, that ceremony is repeated in the theater of Pompeius, the biggest with a capacity of about 25,000 people the very same day in the afternoon. Um, here you see Nero's last portrait type, this magnificent portrait of known from the Glyptotech in Copenhagen, and the kind of body it must have belonged to. That's of course, uh, uh, you know, from context, it, it should have been Nero, uh, known from the Vatican. And with more time and resources, we could have tried a, a sort of 3D reconstruction based on laser scans and bits, and it only graphically. Uh, in the center, you see a cast because the original is in situ, was, was discovered. Part of Neopolis underneath the Vatican in, in 2000s, early 2000s. It's a tombstone for Archimus, uh, a slave servant, enslaved servant of Nero, Caesar, Claudius Augustus, uh, and he was custodian of the stage. Um, so he worked in the theater of, of Pompeius. I like to think that he was among the people who gilded the stage for the ceremony. It's really important, I think, to have objects like these in as well. So not, not only the, the statues of the, the elite members, but of the people who, who were around. And you can't see on the slide that we had the projection of, of the doodle you see on the left, which is from a town on the Palatine. It's again, a very important object. I think there's little doubt that this must be Nero. And to me, like the graffiti and so on, it speaks to this street level popularity of the emperor. Other things in the case in the instance, you see pocket mirrors that include mirrors, coins, and medals. Um, then I have a slide here to show um, the, the tour of Greece, which is obviously hotly debated. Uh, if you follow the sources, get a source quote on the wall. This is the height of Nero's illusion and depravity, where, where he, he uh, takes part in all the contests, all the juries are rigged, and so on. What we don't often get told is that it's, of course, Part of a much bigger leader to a military campaign in the East. Uh, perhaps you could argue that Nero was well attuned and spoke the cultural language of the Greek subjects of the empire. He certainly was very popular, and I think this is a different way of looking at the story. Then we talked about the conspiracies. Uh, I think the, the important thing here again is that if you look at the members of the elite uh, who conspire. They're often the sons, the grandsons, the nephew of nephews of people who were part of previous conspiracies against people like Claudius, like Caligula, uh, and others even before them. So they're family traditions. And I think it's really a sign that the members of the senatorial elite made their peace with one man rule, but they didn't, they didn't like the succession to be hereditary. They wanted it to be elective. And they thought they achieved that uh, under people like like Trajan and Hadrian, uh, the adoptive emperors. And that's the time, of course, when Tacitus and Suetonius write and look back. Important well, on the left, as props, we have a, an evocation of the mind's column, one of the kind of things erected uh, to celebrate Nero's salvation from the plot. On the right, uh, a fragment of the tomb 
of Epaphroditus, one of these influential freedmen ministers of Nero, and the kind of thing that must have riled any senator by him past there. Um, obviously ends with enforced suicide, um, uh, again, Suetonius' account, heavily biased, um, we are told that people don liberty caps, topple Nero's statues, but we also know that there must have been some sort of political deal. Um, his uh, first love, Claudio Yacte, and his wet nurses, Alexandria and Claudia Eclogie, whose tombstone is there in the center, bury him in the tomb of the Abbey, and we hear that immediately people deposit flowers on the tomb, put up his statues again, and so on. The final bit of the exhibition talked about the year of the four, four emperors, the usurpers, um, uh, things like these finds from the battlefields at Bedriacum. Um, you see more detail of this helmet, which has impact marks, quite, quite evocative. Uh, which are signs of hasty Greek manufacture. It's probably uh, when Nero raised the legion from the loyal sailors of the fleet. Uh, this is what they were equipped with. And then the middle ground, you can have finds from rescue excavations in the center of Cremona, important prosperous colony north of the Po, and gets completely destroyed. Uh, out of the fighting, as Rome well, gets heavily damaged thereafter. It really evokes the, the horrors of the civil war. And the last thing, the last object in the exhibition is our own. It's this portrait of Vespasian from Carthage. If you look very closely and we've tried to, so the video overlay to make it clearer, it's recarved like almost all other portraits uh, from a Nero here. So Nero's, some of Nero's portraits get destroyed, damaged, but the vast majority are warehoused and reused. We even have portraits of Hadrian still uh, several decades later that are recast Nero's. Then we leave the visitor with a quote from, from Tacitus, I think, uh, and that relates to the falls Nero's, and that I think is an, an important coda to the exhibition. So 20, 30 years, as you know, after Nero's death, we have imposters in the Greek East, people who probably look like Nero, probably have a nice singing voice, pretend that the emperor. Uh, and the, the important thing here is that they gather a mass following. So clearly Nero's memory was, was contested. It was contested largely along class lines. But this positive uh, folk memory, if you like, eventually was suppressed. And it's the elite view that men's up and is preserved in the literary sources. And nearly at the end, um, this is not to pluck catalogue, but it's, it's well illustrated. It has 100,000 words as opposed to, opposed to the 15,000 words in the exhibition. Uh, so, so a lot more detail there than we could include in the exhibition. Um, next steps will be some legacy projects. We'll work with our colleagues uh, in the Domus area, for example, to locate more precisely our fragments. And uh, I'm sure there will be further conferences and studies on exhibitions. And just to plug here what our colleagues in Leiden are planning, um, there was a Claudius exhibition earlier, there was our Nero exhibition now, and there'll be a, a Domitian exhibition in Leiden from December this year. And with that, I'll finish my quick presentation and, and I hope you have questions. Austin, thank you so much. I mean, um... I, I can only apologize both to you and to um, all our participants that uh, the sound quality was not as good as it should have been. Uh, it is so difficult in these circumstances. Um, uh, we, we're all uh, in a way experimenting uh, with these um, modern um, technological means of communication. And uh, it, it does put us in real difficulty if something like that occurs. But I do hope that uh, most of you heard as much of that, at least as I did, I, I heard most of it. And I thought it was absolutely wonderful. So thank you, Torsten. And uh, we have had some uh, very interesting questions uh, coming through the Q&A. First of all, um, about the historiography of this, uh, you started with this. Um, that recent work on Nero, uh, a lot of it, and um, someone asked if, if you found anything uh, in recent historiography that shared your unbiased view of Nero or attempting to get at an unbiased view by uh, trying to um, get away from the subsequent myth that developed, and whether there was anything that you found particularly helpful in reaching an unbiased view of Nero? Well, I, I think some of the studies, and they're, you know, they're in the bibliography of the catalogue. Uh, 
I don't want to mention individual examples, but there's good stuff that's come out in English as well. It's really a detailed analysis. I mean, there's good comparison of the sources on the mission and on Nero, for example, of a conflict yeah. as well. It's really that we understand the political background of the writers, but we also understand the literary strategies and techniques. And we have, you know, just as an example, we have these anecdotes that are told about different emperors, the same anecdote, and you see patterns. Uh, and it really is invective. I mean, these people, it's, it's part of their rhetorical training. Um, as you have court panegyric, uh, and sadly very little is, dis is preserved from the, from the Neronian period and the dates are, of what days are disputed. Um, yeah. You have panegyric, positive, and you have invective. And there's, there's almost no middle ground. And I think realizing that, and, and as I said, it's my, I mean, you, you know, people are welcome to disagree, but I think there's, there are good, there's good research now. I, I always read the sources. I felt embarrassed a little bit because you know, mm. I thought there's a good layer of factual information and some, some flourishes and exaggerations. But I, I read them now really throughout almost as political metaphors that, that make a certain point um, you know, that's to do with their background and, and the invention is in coming up with a good new anecdote that makes that point in a funny, witty way. Yes, thank you. Um, one suggestion is that if you turned off the screen sharing, Tolston, we might hear you a little bit better. I think we, we'd, we'd see more of you as well. So if you could do that, we could. Okay. Yeah, good. Um, now, a couple of... Um, related questions really about the um, um, the portrait sculptures. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, there, there, there's a lot of dispute, uh, isn't there, about the identification of some of the busts. Um, and uh, it was asked whether how exactly you addressed this problem and, and resolved it to your satisfaction when preparing the exhibition. I, 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 yes, that's right. I agree. Uh, it's a good question. I, I think Nero, we're, we're certain, and we have the coinage. I didn't show examples, so we can date his portrait types closely um, and identify them closely. As I said, for the women, uh, it's much harder. And I think that is part of the story. I mean, why is it that we, we know all the male characters and can identify the portraits, but we can't be sure about the women? I think that tells us a lot about their status in society and the way they were treated by the elite, it is the damnatio. Yes. Uh, I, I, as I said, we put them together in a section just to make the point. Akabina is prominent on coins, fine with her. Um, there was a bust that has been identified as, as Claudia Octavia, Claudius's daughter. I think, I think that's extremely uncertain. She looks more like Olivia or uh, mm. Princess. Popea may be more secure. I think, I think the point is the uncertainty here. Yes, absolutely. No, I, I, I thank you for that. Um, and, um, another question is about the um, that, that marvelous section where you have a family tree of the um, uh, Julio Claudian dynasty represented by uh, busts and sometimes mm. full size sculptures and so on. And uh, the question about how you set about choosing these. I mean, what determined your choice of either a bust in one case or a, um, could you could you help us with yeah, that. I mean, it's a mix of um, finding the right types, official types, having a bit of variation. There was a statue of Germanicus, which is important in Toga, for example. Tiberius was, was idealized and Claudius. Um, so it's so a mix of things. Um, full length, um, us, sometimes we only have heads. Uh, and then, you know, uh, obviously there's a bit of serendipity with what can travel, what can't. I was very pleased and very grateful to our colleagues in Copenhagen, for example, who gave us the Gaius Polygula, which is very important because it has spaces of polygamy as well. Yes. And it is, of course, a matter of what is available and what you were able to lay your hands on. And um, we had a, an interesting question um, mm -hmm. about um, what uh, item you feel that, that you weren't able to show that you would most like to have been able to if, if money and uh, logistics were no object? Yes, I mean, the, the, the aphrodisias relief, which I'm not sure had been lent, um, would have been fantastic. Yes. I think it tells the story. I would have loved to have the original. And in fact, we had, to, uh, we had meetings in Ankara. Our director went out to the ministry and so on. It all looked quite promising. But then, uh, then COVID happened. It, it just wasn't an option. I mean, we were really lucky. 
Um, yeah, almost all the objects are in the exhibition. We opened on time, um, but it made many compromises necessary. And a big thank you to, to our partner institutions for trusting us and sending the objects anyway. Yes, indeed. I mean, it was a wonderful exhibition from that point of view. And I can only commend uh, your dedication to um, getting only as far as possible items that uh, were contemporary with the actual events. I mean, that really, in a way, was an eye opener. And I think is a, the way to get as close as we can to uh, a completely unbiased picture, which, of course, I, I, in the nature of things is impossible. But mm -hmm. But uh, I think you approached it in, in a, a really wonderful way. Um, finally, um, it, uh, someone asked if, if you had a text or were able to produce a text of this uh, wonderful talk, which um, we then might be able to circulate through the Roman society um, to help people who weren't able to hear all your comments. <laughs> No, I don't have a text. Uh, <laughs> listen back to the recording and, and sort of read my own lips and, and sort of put it together. But, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's just very, very unfortunate. Very frustrating. I mean, there is the, the video is online and there, there is, there's obviously the catalogue and, and maybe we could... Yes, I think, I think that's right. Uh, and we are recording uh, this, so people can go back and try and do the best they can. But with that, I, I, I mean, I, I must draw the proceedings to a close. But um, first of all, I'd like just to say to everyone that we do have another event coming next week um, on um, the 27th of October, which is a conference um, on the city of Rome, which is going to take place in Senate House and members can attend in person. There are still some places available if you'd like to um, uh, contact Fiona and book a place, but otherwise it will be um, also beamed out online in the usual way. So um, it'll be very good to see people both in reality and on screen on the 27th, which is next week. Um, but finally, I'd like to thank Thorsten, I mean, both for the exhibition itself, which as I say, was absolutely wonderful and for taking us uh, through it in, in that very interesting way and explaining some of the things that I must say hadn't dawned on me when I went to see it. Um, you know, the panels um, were very informative, but you know, always, you felt, I want more. And uh, to have you take us through it in that way was really marvelous. So I would like to thank you very, very much on behalf of all our members. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me.